Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, on a slightly dodgy day, but hopefully we're going to uh, get away with it. We're going to keep things relatively short. Um, so this is the unveiling of the plaque, which you're going to see soon, which is... Unveiling of the plaque. I don't know if this is... Uh, perhaps this could be brought out. Yeah? Take it out of its bag, it might help. Is that better? Okay, so uh, I'm Alex, one of Julian's sons, um, and we're here, uh, the park is really um, in memorial to my dad, and as you'll see, it's uh, an amazing thing um, by Melissa Fairbanks, uh, and Astrid's going to unveil it in a second. Um, I always thought Julian had the touch of the magical realist, and it's sort of been captured uh, very much in the park. Anyway, there's quite a few people who are going to do some short speeches, so we'll start with the unveiling, um, Astrid, who's uh, one of Julian and Joan's granddaughters. Take it away, Astrid. Oh, so you'll all you get a chance to, uh, to have a look at it, um, and you'll see that it's got uh, things in the local area in there. A, a You're right. Dad swimming with a piano. Um, now there's some songs which we're going to have, but um, first up is uh, is Brenda who's going to say a few words. Where's Brenda? I'm here. There she is. Okay. I could always spot Julian on the heath, a tall, imposing figure with a distinctive shock of white hair, but he wore his stat stature lightly. I once heard a lecture he gave at an international conference and was surprised that I understood every word of it. He clearly fulfilled Einstein's criteria that if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you don't really understand it. Growing up, his family enjoyed home amateur dramatics influenced by traditional English comedy and music hall jokes and songs. Our children have fond memories of such drama productions in the left house, and many were invited to their singing seders, in which the Passover story was told humorously with songs written to music hall and popular tunes by Joan, Julian, and their circle of friends. To us, his professional but his, sorry, his professorial demeanor was tempered with warmth and kindness and humor. Julian always helped when he could, with someone who made people he encountered feel they could be better. Our son, Dan, who is here, says that Julian played a huge part in his childhood and influenced the rest of his life. Thanks so much, Brenda. Okay, we're moving on to uh, a neighbour next, Stephen Taylor. Take your time coming through, it's slippery. I'm not sure what that box is doing there. It's a whole I was uh, not a fat member of Julian's huge family, not a colleague of his, and didn't know him uh, prof his work professionally. I, I'm not a fellow musician. I can't speak to any of his accomplishments on that. I was just a neighbour, a word uh, in Damon Runyon's wonderful phrasing, a guy who is just around. One of my core skills is complaining, and I complained years ago to my partner, Miki, that having been living here a few years, I didn't really know anybody. And she told me, wash your car. <laughs> So I washed my car, and I had some conversations with a few people passing by. Uh, some of them were Joan and Julian, and the end result was a group of us wound up in Joan and Julian's front room, planning some street drinks in the party. And that turned into the Hillsiders group with its email list and, and so forth, and is part of the reason why some of us are here. Julian was kind of, of a presiding angel for much of this. I like to hide my natural pessimism and cynicism beneath a cheery exterior, considering my pessimism too corrosive to be exposed to daylight. I, Julian, I almost felt as a, um, as almost a standing reproach to me for his warmth, his 
his natural optimism and his curiosity, it was an inspiration to me oh, and always has been. I shall miss him hugely, even though I was just a neighbour. And thinking about him, he brought to mind Auden's words. Defenceless under the night, our world in stupor lies, yet dotted everywhere. Ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them, of eros and of dust, show an affirming flame. Thank you so much, Stephen. Now, a lot of you here will have uh, known Julian for a, a, a lot of time, a huge amount of time, but one of the people who's known him the longest uh, is an old school friend, Alan Mushin, who's next to speak. Thank you, Thank you Alan. I first met Julian in 1947 <laughs> at primary school, and then we went on to Haberdashers together, which was a, a direct grammar school in those days. We were very close friends, and neither of us liked rugby and contact sports, but we played a lot of tennis together, mainly in my garden. We played croquet, and the nicest thing was that in his parents' home in Finchley Road, in his dad's study, there was this very big table. And Julian and I would creep in, take all the books and papers off, get out of the net, and play table tennis for hours on end until his parents shoot us out. Um, Julian lived there for many years with his parents and actually his maternal grandparents, who I remember well. They were always very kind to me. Julian, following his father, was a very strong chess player, a very good swimmer, a good debater, and at school was, of course, extremely bright, and it could be seen very early on that he was always interested in people, not just facts, but he was always looking at people and talking to them and discussing things. And it was only right that he became a psychiatrist. In 1955, uh, he went to UCH, I went to the London in Whitechapel. I must say, I got a lot of experience of people in the East End of London in those days, it was great. And we used to come to each other's shows. Julian was very musical, helped to put on some of the Christmas shows with Jonathan Miller. But later on, our paths rather diverged. We saw each other occasionally, but not quite so much. But the memories of school stay with us, and so do the photographs. Uh, his last years were not so good. I saw him a little bit, but his memories live on and his work lives on. And I just mentioned to Joan that recently I found a copy of one of his books given to me and all inscribed. And I passed it on to my niece who's just become a consultant psychiatrist. And she was so excited at finding a book by Julian Neff. She thanked me tremendously and I would thank all the family as well for everything that Julian did. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. That was lovely. Okay, now, at the very end, or near the end, we're going to have a chance to sing together, but now we're going to have a song from Hugh Goodacre. Where's Hugh? Here we are. Hi. No, I'll do it without it. Okay, he's going to do it without the mic. It's a request from Joe. I'll sing it without the mic. Dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you or me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. In Salt Lake City, Joe, I cried, him standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, said Joe, but I ain't dead. Said Joe, but I ain't dead. The copper bosses killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe, says I. Takes more than guns to kill a man, said Joe. I didn't die, said Joe, I didn't die. And standing there is a big 
naked slides and smiling with his eyes. Says he, what they forgot to kill went on to organize, went on to organize. Joe Hill ain't dead, he says to me. Joe Hill ain't never died. Where workers strike and organize, Joe Hill is at their side. Joe Hill is at their side. From San Diego up to Maine, in every mine and mill, where workers strike and organize, it's there you'll find Joe Hill. It's there you'll find Joe Hill. Dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you or me. Thank you. Um, it seems only fitting after a political song that we have the political member of the family. It's a tradition in the left family that there's at least one radical in every generation. I'm going to pass on to John T. Oh, hi, thanks. Well, that was a great rendition of uh, Joe Hill. That was brilliant. And Joe Hill's uh, words, you know, um, don't mourn, organise. I think that's really fitting. Um, actually, there's a woman in our movement from Sierra Leone, Aminata and uh, she was going to get evicted and she said stop crying start fighting which i thought was quite a good way to live your life and um you know dad was a fighter and he came from a fighting family because in setting up the nhs um you know sam his dad was the co-chair no sorry honorary honorary secretary of the london branch of the socialist Association of Doctors and actually they were in opposition to the BMA it was the British Medical Association didn't want an NHS at the beginning there was a split you know the doctors were um, you know they thought they were going to lose money they had to be won over and there was a big fight over it and Vera as well in her book um, Are You Going Our Way sort of explains about the fight that they were both in to set up the NHS and it was set up in 1948 you know they won as everyone knows and of course she was in a fight uh, to set up the CND you know ban the bomb and all of that so um, this was a and and dad was in a fight and dad was in a fight to um, change the NHS and to bring it out of well he actually took me to free and um, to, yeah, that hospital in Free and Barnet. I remember it because I must have been really young, but it really was Victorian. I mean, it was horrific. It was like one of these horror movies, you know, with people locked away. And he and he fought really hard against that and got them shut, which was great. And then organised the care in the community. So, you know, when you put up a plaque, uh, I suppose you think about legacy and memories and all of this and I think in particular atheists amongst us you know you think well what is the point if we don't change the world and leave something behind and this sort of thing but the astonishing combination about dad was that he did change the world in very big ways in, in the NHS but there wasn't that sort of legacy thing there wasn't that sort of um, you know there wasn't oh uh, you know how am I going to you know, there wasn't that yearning for some sort of legacy acknowledgement. You know, there was a sort of real humbleness. Ness, ness, humbleness, ness, ness, ness. And I think it's a lesson to all of us, really, uh, because when you create something or you create a project or, you know, a system, that it, it becomes bigger than us because other people take it over, you know, and it's then that it has its own life and it sort of develops. And I think that that's... And, and that's right, someone said that um, he's sorry, that his work, you know, really lives on. And I think that it really does, and it has a life of its own, and it's developing, the projects are developing throughout the NHS. And so, yeah, okay, I, you know, I think it's that generosity that, um, you know, that, that I'll definitely remember and maybe learn a few lessons from myself, I hope. All right, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Okay, next up is uh, a, a fellow musician and friend, Stina. I hope this works. 
I have to read this or I'll get longer than I want to be. I knew Julian for almost half a century and all I want to say is thank you, Julian. For intellectual and imaginative challenges and productive arguments ranging from multivariate social research design to quality assurance of very unorthodox healing activities and imaginative avatars. For professional compassion and empathy with our shared, warm, and much maligned Elephant and Castle community of students, patients, researchers, their parents, and families. For your incredibly talented hands making delicate jewelry, aquariums from fireplaces, Hollywood jacuzzis from garden lean-tos, and turning every square foot around you into a magical space, and making whatever piano you put your hands to sound grand. For your immense love of my friend Joan, who introduced me to you, of her mother and brother, her big family, all your children, and your permanently expanding, now very large family. For holding my hand when I very much needed it, wiping my tears with amusing and very uplifting stories of your parents, uncle, grandparents, and their passionate political struggles with each other in the world, which you have now heard is being carried on. For all those evenings slogging away practicing chamber music at Morley College, Apologies for occasionally walking away when your passionate interpretations of Brahms may have seemed brilliant to you, Julian, but in chamber music, a minim with crescendo is still a minim, and a syncopated quaver is a quaver whichever way even a senior consultant looks at it. <laughs> and finally, for teaching me, there is nothing wrong in shamelessly loving and appreciative audience, be it in a lecture, a bookshop, a concert hall, and for being seriously bloody-minded in the face of respectability when it really mattered. Thank you, Julian. You made the world a better place. That was wonderful. Thanks, Tina. So we've heard from um, friends, colleagues, musicians, family, um, but now we're going to hear from uh, a friend but also a professional, um, Professor Steve Hirsch is going to say some words. Uh, I got to know Julian when he joined the social psychiatry unit at the Institute of Psychiatry. And I was a registrar and I, we decided to do a study of parents of schizophrenics. Uh, the unit was particularly interested in schizophrenia, and at the time there, there were notions, particularly in the United States at the National Institute of Mental Health, that uh, schizophrenia was caused by the way parents interacted with their children and the way they uh, communicated with their children. So we decided to review the literature, and Julia and I re we reviewed uh, about 250 papers in detail, and then we did our own study of uh, comparing the parents of schizophrenics, neurotics, and normal people, uh, and how they spoke in relation to a raw shock stimulus. Well, this, the, the details of the study are not so important, uh, but we uh, what we found was, in fact, that there were no really important differences between the parents of schizophrenics. It's just that the fathers talk more, and the fathers probably talk more because they were anxious. Uh, but this started Julian's interest in families of schizophrenics, and he went on to study the emotional impact of uh, over-involved parents, uh, which tended to cause higher relapse rates in people who had had schizophrenia, it didn't cause the illness, but it did cause higher relapse rates uh, if they were, if the parents were too emotionally in, in, in involved. 
and he went on to and continue to study uh, and be interested in, in families and, and parents. And he went and he developed his own uh, uh, form of therapy called Atavar therapy. I think. Avatar. 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 Okay. It came after I retired, so I, I never got my mind about it. Hmm? Uh, maybe didn't to say a word about it then. That'd be good. But it was always a pleasure working with Julian, and he was a great man. He had great love for his patients. He was uh, greatly appreciated by everybody who uh, had contact with him at the Maudsley and the Institute of Psychiatry. And it's a great loss that he's no longer with us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Dinesh Mugra and I had the great privilege of working with Julian. I first met Julian in 1986. Um, I was a trainee in Leicester and uh, did my basic training in psychiatry and we read Julian's work. And, you know, sometimes you feel <clears throat> that, you know, you don't really want to meet your heroes because they may be disappointing or, you know, you may feel that they have feet of clay, but Julian was exceptional. The first time I met him, um, it was as if we had been friends forever. And although, you know, I mean, you know, John T has talked about uh, closure of Freyan and the work that he did there, and Stephen has talked about um, expressed emotion and work with uh, families patients with schizophrenia but he never stopped he kind of kept building on building on it and for me I mean I think it's kind of latest contribution to which Alex had been involved as well which was the avatar therapy uh, particularly for patients with schizophrenia so showed a his intellectual ability b uh, his concern and commitment for patients and their families who were suffering and quite often, uh, we know from clinical work that patients with chronic severe mental illness get forgotten because everybody is busy dealing with depression and anxiety and so serious mental illness get forgotten. But Julian kept that fight going. And I'm also grateful to Julian for introducing Mike and me to the family who welcomed us with open arms. And we felt part of the family. And for me, Julian will never go. Julian will always be there in research, in our thoughts, in our actions. Because you always think, what would Julian say? What would Julian do? So, thank you, Julian. Look after yourself and look after others wherever you are. Thank you. Okay, well, Joan's going to wrap things up, but before she does, we're all going to join in with a song. I don't know, is, uh, is Hugh going to play or are we doing it a cappella? I'm not sure. Shall we turn? Right. How are we going to do this? Everyone's supposed to join in. We're the same. We're not saints. Well, none of us are saints. We're all 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 saints.
Yeah. Yeah. A bit more practice needed for next time. <laughs> An encore, seems, perhaps. Huh? Seems fitting to have a song where no one can agree, a traditional song where no one can agree what the words are. Yeah. Joan, um, we're going to finish up with you. Unless there's somebody else who wants to speak, is there? Well, what I want to do is to first of all thank Melissa for the wonderful plaque. Is Melissa here? I can't see. Oh, there she is. There she is. Thank you for the wonderful plaque. And no ceremony is complete without witnesses. So I want to thank you all for coming and witnessing this and participating in it. Um, I want to thank Jonathan and Michael for this wonderful garden, and I hope you take advantage of it. And just to mention a few people, Pedro and Wally and the choir, the, the, the South Hill singers, for all the hours of joy that you gave both Julian and myself. Um, I will be moving very soon to a building just behind the Royal Free here called Bellevue, the pink building. And I hope that I can still remain an honorary member of the South Insiders and uh, continue to see you all here in the garden and on the heath and elsewhere. But thank you again for coming and do help yourself to uh, some refreshments. Second attempt at taking a picture of the. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hey, how? It's very pretty, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>